Hans, Georg, Muller, and uh, Vlad, whose channel I'm forgetting, had this uh, volley of YouTube videos talking about authenticity, which comes out of Charles Taylor's work, and Muller's sort of series of ages, right? This age of sincerity, the contemporary age of authenticity, and then this kind of age of pro-felicity or profile building, which young people today are totally immersed within. And Muller seems to be saying, we need to let go of the age of authenticity. Well, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I would have to like read his book. Well, sure. Because he's careful, actually, not... Yeah to say that he's not advocating. Right. I think he says that specifically. Um, it's almost more like he's giving a descriptive account of the predominant mode of identity, or of understanding identity. But of he time. did seem to think, not as a judgment, a normative judgment, but just as a statement of sociological fact that the age of authenticity was was ending yeah that's yeah that's i guess it's more of like what seems to be a kind of uh insistence on this sequence um as being a real one um that everybody should recognize mm -hmm. um but then vlad kind of put it actually kind of flipped it upside down and yeah. Honestly, uh, it seems to me like rooted pro felicity in 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 like a kind of well, it's just a sort of new and more radical with the technology means of um, not necessarily uh, representing oneself. <laughs> Authentically, uh, yeah. Well, Vlad's point was we sh that he hoped that we could all agree that trying to be authentic, striving for authenticity it's is... a good. Yeah, yeah because if, we, if we're not orienting towards, like, growth in the direction of truth, beauty, and goodness and stuff, like, and stuff... Mm -hmm. then he'd be worried for our mental health, basically. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah, he brought in, like, the necessary consideration of the psychological dimension. As he was sort of suggesting, he's like, we need something more than a sociological account. Right. Right. And I think, you know, McLuhan's old adage, the medium is the message. It's not that... <laughs> Muller's video is highly produced. I mean, compare what he does to, you know, Philosophy Tube or ContraPoints or something, where there's tons of production in terms of the... Yeah, many hours. Many hours go into behind-the-scenes work to, you know, in, from everything from set and costume design to makeup to, you know, the takes, I'm sure doing takes over and over again. a good amount of time goes into his as well. Yeah, but, you know, yes, Muller's... Obviously, the aesthetic is different. <laughs> Muller's more scripted, though, than Vlad, who's, yes. I don't know, in a hotel room or something, holding up a flashlight and a phone to record something without even having an editor to... It showed make... to me uh, the, I guess, the... Uh, um, I don't know, the, the kind of... the the remaining possibility of this, like, immediate, a kind of immediate yeah, but, participation. But still, Vlad is performing immediacy, performing authenticity. I think he even joked about it. Yeah. Um, when the color went off on his camera, and he had to, like, bring the flashlight into view, and, like, you know, the, the medium mm -hmm. cracked for a second, and... Uh, and showed itself in the message. Mm -hmm. But still... The fourth wall broke. But still, there's, there's a way in which I think Muller's deeper point is that to be authentic now, if we could be, would be to include one's own one's awareness avatar. of the inauthentic performance of a profile. 
because there, there would be this new social agreement that, you know, we all know that we're performing and we don't, and he left us with these seven rules at the end to gesture towards this. They were wonderful. Which is like, okay, we all know that we're performing, that we're profile building. And don't we all... reduce someone to their images. Don't reduce yourself to your images. Well, well, Have right. multiple images. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great list. Vlad agreed. It's kind of like, you know, we can think of uh, all of that as being related to like what we would, might call personality. And mm. that, 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 I guess, aspect of ourselves, which is able to, f like, I guess, um, or wants to honor those seven rules, is, like, something more transcendent mm. than, um, than, like, the personality that we have that is also tied to a certain kind of physical expression or physical appearance. <clears throat> transcendence is a sticky word, though. I think, uh... Because I was, you know, in terms of personality as something that we, as the prof the age of profilicity shows, personality is something we have to so, par participate in constructing, right? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, not to say that it's, like, something to be... Hello. Sort of, hello. Uh, gotten rid of. It's, like, a necessary aspect of being in the yeah. phenomenal world. So I was thinking about, like, you know, John Keats's veil of soul making that James Hillman makes such a big deal about and it's you know remaining in the valleys of the soul and not oh yeah rushing to There's transcend this, um, mm -hmm. yeah I was going to share this uh, what was the word oh someone instead of describing the world as a veil of tears mm -hmm. describing it as a gathering place mm. and like a school perpetual school yeah it's the raindrops trying to gather together to refract the light into a rainbow or something it's not just not, I mean the tears as drops that gather together to refract, refract the light into a rainbow uh, which is I guess you, you, you can't see a rainbow from, from above, can you? I don't know. I think you have to see it from below. In the valley of soul making. But if personality is constructed, and it's not just a self-construction. or an, Yeah. It's not just autopoiesis, it's also social. Sympoiesis. Sympoiesis, which is why we're... Uh, I think we're in this transitional period right now, um, mostly because of social media, but it's, you know, not just a technological thing, it's the evolution of consciousness, of which technology is a part of it. Mm. And it's causing this social strife because we're like, it's a double bind, right, as yeah. Mueller was saying, um, drawing on Gregory Bateson double binds which can you know precipitate psychosis um and oh god yeah his his point was that like on the one hand we're told to be ourselves be authentic mm -hmm. don't let anyone tell you what to do be free as a command that if we obey it we're thereby uh contradicting it and so there's like no way to respond to the situation authentically and we're still broken by this and we haven't yet integrated the fact that the personality is both something that belongs to us and something that um, binds us to others yeah it you know it's related to the stars, too. The whole ecology, the cosmic ecology of our... Well, right, coming okay. into being. So we watched this other video by the modern mystic. Oh, yeah. Uh, Nick, who said, you know, he was talking about personality and how he's only really ever heard one theory of the personality, which... Oh, yeah. ...is yeah. like, you know, God creates the immortal soul and that's who we are. Um... 
I know transcendence can seem like a sticky concept for people, but I, when I, I use it, I really, I use it in the sense of like an intuition or uh, something that I can, I guess, intuit from my own embodied experience. It feels like up. Mm -hmm. But it's not up. It's beyond space and time. Yeah, but there's something qualitative about what it means for a human for the experience of the upness. So I think even though, you know, like, conceptually we would describe it as more than just above, there's something about the movement upward that has a qualitative, like, resonance with, I think, transcendence. Maybe not. I guess in a sort of picture consciousness kind of way. Yeah. But then yeah, it's like imaginative. When you... But it's not literal, you know? I'm just thinking about the shift from... Dante's conception of the cosmos and the mm-hmm. location of the divine or the Actually, location of yeah cosmology right yeah, yeah. and where it thinks hello, hello. Hi. the divine realm is and then to be like up or out whereas for once you go through the scientific revolution and you have these this early modern deistic view God's not really out anymore or up God's just beyond space and time altogether. Yeah, but there's also this assumption that what we look upon from here on Earth, uh, when we look up into the sky, that it's just something material. Mm-hmm. But I think we can't actually, if we, if we make that assumption and don't feel like there is something divine, you know, the appearance of divine realities. So how does the firmament, the starry firmament, relate to the personality? What was your oh. sense? <laughs> well, I that. think the birth chart. Uh, yeah, the soul. Is the personality is related to the soul. So people like Nick, who's, I think, fair to say, a atheistic materialist. Who? Uh, the modern mystic. Oh, whose video we listen to about personality. He's talking about God, though. Well, but his view is that there is no person. Uh, Uh You know, he has a sort of mystical materialism at the end of the day, I think. Oh, okay. Um, There's no self. There just isn't. But we have... We play these word games, language games, that tie us up in knots and make us think there is a self. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but what you're saying is it's not a language game, it's a cosmic reality. Yeah, it's a cosmic reality. Thanksgiving. Hello. Hi, thank you. Thanksgiving. Uh, oh. That's a kind of metamorphosing reality. It's not static, but it's, not it's static. real. So what more can we say about it? So uh, we, that it's historical. Because usually to say, it seems like what Muller ultimately is suggesting is that the self is a social construct well i guess i really don't know what he thinks we have to read his book yeah yeah but most sociologists would That's be inclined sort of what you to could take away from the video though, yeah if you weren't given any other alternative and i don't think either of us disagrees but there's also something <laughs> divine or transcendent that's not that is constructed that by social. that what that is in the social hmm you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. To not bifurcate. Yeah. Well, that's why uh, a colleague of ours, Jake Sherman, likes to say that transcendence is the superlative form of imminence. So it's not that God is just beyond time and space. God is also fully present <laughs> in every, you know, occasion of or event within space and time. And the continuous creativity. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, inside or outside no longer have any... When you say... Or... When you refer to the transcendent, you're not referring um, to the far away. Necessarily. 
Yeah, no, I, yeah. Think of it as like, it's just, uh, pain. Yeah, Bruno Latour makes this point too in an interesting way. There's, you know, I won't rehash the whole argument, but he basically ends up saying that transcendence is like, we usually think of it as like the far away is what science is oriented towards. Like, I think about, like, astrophysics and stuff. Yeah. Whereas religion's really about the immediate, like, relationship with ourselves and with other people. And mm-hmm. uh, it's very intimate, actually. It's about the most intimate facts of life. Well, it's like salt and sold. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. It's just Latour's interesting reversal. I guess it depends on the scientist. Sure. Right. Right, if- the science. Yeah, just in the sense that science often references these entities, unrepresented, unrepresentable entities like molecules and atoms and mm-hmm. gravitational fields and whatever that are so far beyond, so remote from our actual experience. They're transcendent in that sense. Yeah, I never think of atoms when I look at the grass. <laughs> I don't think of them really ever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about atomic elements and, like, chemical interactions and reactions, it's sort of like a a mathematical overlay. Okay. You know, it's like we hear the music of the spheres and we can write down this musical score in terms of chemistry and the periodic tables. Uh-huh. And... Last one that I know of. Cool. Have a good day. Um, but the score is not the music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, the score, well, and it's like also like a frozen score. The music never stops. Right. It's like an abstraction out of the, the symphony, the ongoing symphony. Snapshot, yeah. So... The personality is more than the matter of which we are made, right? And yeah, yeah. I think the real challenge for our age is that um, we I mean, we don't believe in anything but matter anymore. We don't believe in anything but our bodily life and the highest values we can really aspire for in this context of a materialistic universe are bodily gratification (laughs) and maybe you know we can say oh well people will remember me because of the art or the traces I leave behind that continue to reverberate through the ages like that's the best we can do and that I think if you unleash social media technology in a context like that where we have no higher aspirations yeah then um yeah, it's going to lead to s- social chaos mm-hmm. and fragmentation. It's like a wild, wild west. It kind of reminds me of uh, ele- the Rethinking Economics lecture when he's talking, Sanders talking about egotism and economics and um, how uh, that will be sort of, that would be sort of made it impossible if the ideal economic situation were um, a reality, which is everyone uh, producing for uh, the other, so being dependent on each other for our, yeah, commodities. Right, well, Steiner's saying with the division of labor, characteristic of modern industrial economies, everyone's working for everybody else. Um, we're producing things for others. and But we're in a false consciousness because we think we're working to earn our own living through the wage system. Mm-hmm. And that's what's broken is this false sense that well, it's I'm this... working for myself, but oh. really we have to all work for each other. And Yeah, that's the reality. Yeah. Um, but that we're in a, an exploitative system. Um And so that's why, you know, pro-felicity is, like, I think, 
ineluctably bound up with capitalism. Right, because we're forced to sell ourselves. Yeah, and this technology has, like, given us a more, like, removed from immediate experience way to continue to play that game Mm. uh, out of egotism. Mm. Which is like kind of thinking that the um, socially constructed personality is the extent of our Yeah, I liked it the way Starner was describing it was that um, altruism is an economic law. It's not a moral precept. It's not something that we should do. It's just how a society with who has discovered the efficiencies of diversification of labor is altruistic because we're all working to produce something that's not for us, right? We're buying the fruits of other people's labor. They're buying the fruits yeah, of our labor. Yeah, that was so interesting that the like that kind of equality has especially been shoved into the fore by economics. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like even sort of it forces us Steiner's economic theory of how individuals and society co-arise really forces us beyond the capitalist socialist Mm -hmm. binary because it just shows that markets are already they already presuppose this profound altruistic relationality yeah interdependence interdependence yeah and we're just in this false consciousness of denying that it's so and thinking no i'm doing it because gotta protect me and mine and it's part, you know, it's probably, I think this is probably all related to the, the alienation from the larger ecology. Yeah. Which yeah. Is, and, you know, a living whole network of relationships. Well, this, I think, relates to our anxiety about personhood and authentic selfhood because we feel separate from the universe not just from each other, but from the whole cosmos. Mm-hmm. And we, because we feel separate, we expect and demand psychologically some private immortality that, like, um, we imagine that our ego should uh, survive the death of the body. I don't know that that should always be construed as such a... Um, but what would I'm talking about the ego that imagines that it's separate from the cosmos yeah not talking about like the higher spirit I know but I think that could be related to an intuition but an egoistic interpretation of an intuition intuition, a spiritual intuition that the ego thinks belongs to it (laughs) yeah and it doesn't well yeah it is heartbreaking you know like I'm gonna die and all my relations will be dissolved into the metamorphosis but of course, if you think that they continue... You will be dissolved into all your relations. And it's not that you won't still be. And well, even... but it's more like... It's not so much like me. It's more like me that gets to know the relations as an individual in relationship to other individuals. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I think that's the kind of heartbreaking thing. But maybe it's not so... Uh, not so... You know, the lights are out. <laughs> Yeah. If that makes sense. I don't think it's lights out. I just think whatever survives is not the ego that was hoping yeah. for some personal afterlife. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And so we don't... It seems like the options, though, for a modern person living in a technological society, the options are uh, either you irrationally like reject materialism and just say nope my soul is eternal i'm going back to god or which is sort of this rapture ideology or you accept materialism and say i'm really not anybody and it'll just all go black when i die and both of these have similar consequences for our behavior Mm -hmm. um, and our psychological state while we're still alive Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's anxiety um, sort of 
sickness, like dis-ease um, with existence because it feels meaningless mm -hmm. and arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And Nihilism. this comes through in people's profile building. Oh, I know. We are living in the, like, I mean, it's kind of like, I wonder if it's like a similar uh, zeitgeist as Dada, Dadaism in the early 20th century and then surrealism because it's just like but it's obviously not the same but there's like a similar kind of irreverent just like exploding of meaning yeah well I mean I guess the world wars really helped explode meaning and then surrealism and whatnot was a response to the yeah chaos of war but we haven't had at least in the developed or western democratic countries like warfare for a while oh. especially the united states and uh i really do hope we've lost our stomach for it but even so i, too. I can't imagine it happening there's clearly a, a culture of war going on at the level of um, symbolic formation and uh, the mimetic exchange mm -hmm. online. So there's no coherent culture. Mm -hmm. There's just a war of all against all. Yeah, it's just like a bunch of silos. Missile silos. So how can we bring more authenticity into the web environment and I mean into daily life too but oh I was just about to say <laughs> that what one thing that Mueller pointed out that is said so often is be spontaneous <laughs> mm -hmm. but I think there's truth in it you know but don't do it because I mean I think you can even like heed that and be spontaneous you know like yeah um it is a paradox or a contradiction i guess but but it's a living activity so like it i think immediately transcends the given once it's like leaned into and new possibilities are always there hmm. you know like novelty and whitehead I forget who used this word i heard recently tense agrity it's oh, like I have the integrity that results from holding the opposites together. Yeah, there's somebody <laughs> in particular who uses that a lot. Yeah, who was that? I forget, but yeah, it captures the life is the tension of opposites. So you you can't like understand. It's the polarity. Yeah, you can't understand life by reduction to its parts, and you can't understand life by in a freeze frame it's always going to be overcoming itself passing through one opposite passing into the next mm -hmm. but what do you think how do you bring more authenticity um maybe into i think pro felicity or is pro felicity that i can't i don't know that i would there's anything like particular to be prescribed but you could do things like practices other than that aren't necessarily related to that but that have effects on how you do things in life in general which might be like to observe plants regularly plant, oh. plant development mm -hmm. so that your soul is like attuned to the metamorphosing uh, activity of the world mm. Imitate. It's like growing that organ of perception. And imitate the green things. Yeah. Or at least allow them to unfold in their soul. I mean, we have our, because we're plant like, you know, so we have our own already unfolding ways of being plant, but maybe we're unconscious of those and plants help to awaken us to it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Teachers, you know? There's so much wisdom in, you know, the traditions which, you know, think of plants as teachers. 
Yeah, I mean, there is a simplicity about trees in particular, and in a sense, mm-hmm. um, they just unpretentious. grow toward the light. <laughs> yeah, and in growing toward the light, become they become noble creatures. Yeah, that's and beautiful. Yeah, we can be more like trees, I think, because it's just as obvious, like. what it is that people really want most is to love and be loved. I don't think anyone really disagrees with that, you know? It's it's obvious. Not that it's easy to realize, but that's what everyone wants. And the tree the tree's growing towards what it loves and what is it is loved by. And we could there's the sun within That's the spirit that's at the root of our personalities. And we just have to grow towards it together. We can all see it Mm -hmm. or feel its warmth. Yeah, we're like constituted by it. But maybe that's also something we're kind of unconscious of, you know, because of the way uh, our economic realities are. You know, people are so survival you know where so many people are driven into a survival mode like there's not enough sun to go around yeah there's not enough light there's not enough warmth there's not enough love like it's a scarce resource Mm -hmm. why do we how do we become convinced of such a silly idea well Well, through bad experiences yeah yeah but also maybe certain narratives about bad experiences too because mm-hmm. narrative can really profoundly alter. A different narrative can alter the way it's like a. I don't know if I'm gonna pronounce this correctly, but the gestalt switch. Gestalt, yeah. Like a different. It's you know simply being told like that. There's a giraffe in that that uh, agglomeration of marks. Then you see the giraffe. And then, but if you have a different story or like a different kind of metaphysical framework. When you see things, if it's got any stake in reality, you see, you see things you wouldn't have seen before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Believing is seeing, in other words. <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just perception and... It we, depends on what you're believing in. <laughs> you can't perceive anything without the uh, aid of concepts. Concepts help uh, resolve percepts. Mm-hmm. 